Thank you, Anna, for that uh, kind introduction, and I'm uh, delighted to be here. Um, I have uh, participated in this WISE conference, I guess this will be my third year, and in the first two years um, I was a panelist and really enjoyed meeting all the uh, young people in the room, um, and this year I was promoted to be a keynote speaker uh, because somebody dropped off, but that's okay, I'm happy, delighted to be here. Um, and, I, and I really want to uh, congratulate Francoise on a fantastic talk. It's, it's really thought-provoking and really, really important. And uh, I think I want to give you an applause on that. So this one, we're shifting gears now. We're becoming a lot more accessible. Uh, and um, not that yours was not accessible. It was actually fantastic. Um, and so I was asked to um, describe my own personal journey and convey some themes that I think are important in order to set uh, you guys up for uh, what we hope that we'd all consider to be success. And so the three thoughts that I had were curiosity, compassion, and clarity. So first, I have no conflict of interest to declare. Um, and as I've already alluded to, I'm just gonna go through a little bit of my own personal uh, journey and focus a little bit more on each of the themes of curiosity, compassion, clarity, and then finish with a few uh, quick concluding uh, remarks. And so uh, my personal journey um, is I'm a first generation immigrant. Um, so um, I was born in Taipei, in Taiwan. Uh, my parents uh, had, were mainland Chinese and uh, they <clears throat> escaped from the communist China uh, and they met in Taiwan and got married. And uh, so my parents thought that the communists were just gonna be around for a couple of months. Um, they got that one wrong. And uh, so I have no pictures of any of my uh, grandparents. And uh, so that, uh, that shows you the interesting uh, influences of, of history. And so my mother had decided a long time ago uh, that Taiwan was just a transient stopover. Um, it was not going to be a place that she felt was going to be able to provide success for her kids. And, and plus there's also military, mandatory military service. And so that uh, my mother also deemed was gonna be a complete waste of time for my brother. And so um, she basically told my dad one day that we're gonna leave. And then she actually wanted to go to the US, um, but dad uh, was an engineer, didn't have any contacts in the US, and, but did have contacts in Toronto. And then when my mother looked at the map, she thought, okay, Toronto's close enough to the US. Good enough, let's, let's, let's go. And so that's how we ended up in, uh, in Toronto. And there's a picture of uh, myself and my brother when we were very young. And the reason I talk about my brother is he's four and a half years older than me, and that was kind of an advantage uh, because he was the one who received most of the attention from my tiger mom. Um, and that was good, and, and he's very, very successful. Um, he's, uh, he was a, he's also a cardiologist, clinician, scientist, and I worked here at the University of Toronto for several decades, and in 2012, he was recruited to Ottawa as a director of the Ottawa Research uh, Institute. And he's a super uh, high-achieving person. He's got you know, a lot of grants, that uh, more grants than I have, more high-impact publications, um, invited to more talks around the world. But I always say to everybody, you know, I have to do something that's a little bit better than him and that has more hair than him. <laughs> you gotta always focus on the positive, right? Um, and so because he's had most of the attention, I kind of flew under the radar screen um, and I graduated from medical school here at U of T in 1980 because Peter kind of, Uncle Peter as we call him, kind of forged the path uh, ahead of me and I always thought, well, if he could do it, I could do it just as well, if not better. Um, and I was also really fortunate to fly under the radar uh, for my parents because in 1976 when I got into medical school, I just kind of quietly told my parents, um, I'm going to medicine. And they said, oh, that's, that's really nice. We didn't even know that you applied. So this is good, you know, like to not to have as much pressure. Um, and so Peter went to medicine, internal medicine. I trained in internal medicine here in Toronto. Um, and I've always had this um, uh, fascination with uh, cancer. Um, and I think, how many people have heard of the Encyclopedia Britannica? Oh, excellent, wow, I thought everybody just does wiki nowadays. And so, so we, you know, I grew up with Encyclopedia Britannica and, um, and I just, and I went into the cancer section, which at that time only had like 10 pages. So it was really easy to read. Uh, and I always thought this is like really weird that you have this cell that's in part of your human body and it just goes completely out of control and, and, and obviously produces major problems. And so I've always wanted to do oncology. 
Um, and of course, when you're in medical school and in, in internal medicine, you heard about a lot about medical oncology, which is the you know specialty that uh, treats systemically using chemotherapy. Um, and when I was trying to decide on, on applying into uh, medical oncology, one of my mentors, Dr. Daniel Perot, had said, you know, Fifi, you have to be prepared for the fact that your uh, practice is going to turn over every four years. Now, remember, this is in the early 1980s, and I kind of thought oh my God, I think what she's referring to is the fact that my patients are all going to die within a four-year period because back then in the 1980s, medical oncology was a very um, less happy specialty, let's say. And I'm you know, one of these happy, kind of go-lucky type of people, and I kind of thought, that really sounds depressing. I don't really want that. And so what are my other options? And they said, well, there is a specialty called radiation oncology, which is the administration of ionizing radiation uh, to patients. And, you know, and they treat, like, skin cancers, you know, and people do really well. And I kind of thought, okay, well, that's how I'm going to uh, pursue the rest of my career. This is just kind of showing you that, you know, there's only so much you can plan uh, ahead of time. And so so I ended up in radiation oncology and finished in 1986. Um, and in 1987, I went down to Stanford University uh, Medical Center to pursue a fellowship in hyperthermia. Now, as, you know, as I said, you know, my brother went to, he spent two years in nuclear cardiology at Harvard. I didn't want to go to the same place. So I went down to Stanford in Palo Alto, which was like beautiful, really much nicer climate than Boston. Um, and, you know, and I worked really, really hard. Um, and so I spent a lot of my time, um, and, uh, you know, enjoying. Uh, so one of my uh, good friends, uh, Dr. Woody Wells, uh, who's also a radiation oncologist, was there in Stanford a year, a year ahead of me. Um, and uh, we hung out and became best friends forever. Um, and he had this beautiful uh, BMW convertible. Uh, and so we would take, you know, sort of weekend sojourns down to Big Sur. Um, and in those days, in 1987, Palo Alto, Northern California, was a wonderful place. You could find parking. You could actually, you know, walk to places, and the traffic wasn't crazy. Uh, of course, what I should have probably done is bought a house there, and I would have just retired. But of course, I didn't do that because I didn't have any money. Um, but I also uh, got into the lab, um, and this was kind of an, a new experience for me uh, because I've never been in a laboratory before, uh, but I w got into the lab and really loved it, and that's actually how I then ended up being a physician scientist. Uh, so I did really did work hard. Um, and this is a picture in 1989. So I came back to the Princess Margaret in Toronto in 1988. And this is a picture uh, of our uh, department back in 1989. And similar to the kind of story that Francoise will be, uh, has already told us, uh, two key observations. Number one, that out of a department of 23, there were only three women. And out of this department of 23, there were only three visible minorities, and I'm the only Asian female. And I remember this in 1989 because I was also uh, pregnant at that time with our older son. Um, and, um, and, and the picture here in the middle, the, the, the man standing with the, with the glasses, that's Professor Bill Duncan, who was the, uh, the uh, chair of the department at the time. And I had... Um, said to him when he recruited me, I said, well, you know, I really like to be a physician scientist. And at that time, there was no concept of what a clinician scientist was. And he said, um, oh, that's excellent, Dr. Liu, who's he's Scottish. This is like my attempt at emulating a Scottish accent. That, that is excellent. Here's your, here's your full-time clinical practice. And, and you can do your science and research in the weekends and the evenings. And, and good luck with that. Uh, so that's what I did, uh, because, you know, um, you kind of produce and, and, and go where your motivations are. And this is where I talk about the first uh, theme, which is curiosity. Curiosity about everything in life. And that has been always one of my key uh, drivers. And so... Um, so I was, uh, you know, my, my research, you could either think about it as a lot of, you know, breath and very shallow or attention deficit disorder, or I could be entrepreneurial. It depends on how you want to think about it. And so, so when I came back, um, so the, the fellowship that I pursued down in Stanford was on hyperthermia, uh, and uh, because in those days, hyperthermia had a lot of promise. Uh, the biology with hyperthermia was absolutely awesome because it was complementary 
complementary to the effects of ionizing radiation, so that in cell lines and in animal models, we did fantastically in terms of curing human cancers. But the challenge is the technical application of hyperthermia when it comes to uh, in humans. And so that always has been very, very limiting. Um, and so, but you know, but I pursued it uh, uh, for you know, a good 13 years. Um, but you could see that in about uh, 10 years into this, I decided to kind of switch tracks into uh, gene therapy. You know, the idea, as Francoise has talked about in terms of genes, um, is that in those days then, it became very, very apparent that cancer is a genetic disease. It's an aberration of the genomic aberrations which drive human malignancies. And so the idea that you could either overexpress or knock down genes and then be able to affect the course of human cancers was extremely uh, exciting and, uh, and innovative. Um, and, uh, but we, you know, we, I pursued that and persevered for about 10 years into that because, again, the technical application broadly for human cancers was, again, uh, very limited. And nowadays, there is obviously a little bit more um, applications, but it's still a fairly challenging uh, area in terms of the broad application in humans. Um, and then in about 2004, I sort of then became a little broader in my pursuits with conducting a lot more translational research in terms of expression profilings. We did a lot of genomic profiling on human tumors, uh, and uh, we also developed molecular therapies, and uh, we had filed uh, patents on a lot of the innovations in that area. I developed biomarker work, again, in trying to prognosticate different groups of patients, and also focused uh, towards the uh, later years on microRNA profiling. But then in the recent five to six years, uh, our lab has also then switched in terms of looking at cancer toxicities. And so one of the emerging challenges in our world is that because of the advent and advances made in improved cancer diagnosis and improved cancer treatment, the good news is that we have a huge number of cancer survivors. And in the coming few years, Canada, for example, will have two million cancer survivors. But unfortunately, a significant minority of these patients will experience a lot of the toxicities of the treatments that we have administered to our patients. And so we really need to understand the biology behind that, the pathogenesis, and be able to develop treatments that's going to mitigate and improve their quality of life. And so we've been focusing a bit on fibrosis, uh, which is a scarring that results from our treatments, and on lymphedema, which is the swelling in the arm that can affect up to about 30% patient of patients who are breast cancer survivors. We've had a lot of um, uh, fun in our labs. In so um, here are pictures of uh, the folks in our lab and the, and the gentleman sitting to, the, to your left, my right, Dr. Ken Yip. It's a great, nice story because he graduated from, with a PhD in my lab, uh, you know, probably about 15 uh, plus years ago. Uh, went down to La Jolla, California, spent two years of research in, as a postdoc at the Burnham Research Institute, and then came back to Toronto and said, you know, I'd really like to work in your lab and I'd like to help you to run your lab. And, and, and Ken's just been absolutely amazing as a, as a scientific associate and manager, and has really um, helped me mentor a lot of the folks uh, in our program. We always have a lot of fun, and you know we love eating, and so this is like a summer uh, annual event that we always uh, go and have lunch as a lab, and uh, and this is a picture last year and uh, in the summer where I combined forces with Scott Bratman, who is another uh, young radiation oncologist, physician, scientist, and our two labs got together, and there's a sort of this uh, rowing. Uh, uh, event that you can row from the city across to Center Island. That was a huge amount of fun, and, and we're obviously on the Center Island side now and uh, having uh, beer and, uh, and drinks. And so it's important really to have a lot of fun. And so over the years, uh, you know, we've published a number of uh, high-impact papers. These are most, uh, our most cited papers in, in hyperthermia, microRNA profiling, and we were also one of the first labs to identify the HPV, the human papillomavirus, in human uh, oral pharyngeal or tonsillar carcinoma. MicroRNA profiling and the two bottom papers are, um, uh, are, are a recent work where we identified uh, metabolic dysregulation as one of the fundamental processes that's driving radiation fibrosis. And this was published in the inaugural issue of Nature Metabolism a year ago. And then also uh, this month, uh, we'd also uh, had written a, a review paper uh, on how metabolic dysregulation underlies a lot of the human fibrosis conditions beyond just radiation, like liver fibrosis, 
pulmonary, cardiac, et cetera, which is actually responsible for a significant uh, number of deaths uh, around globally. And so that's a lot of fun. And um, so I've had several mentors uh, through, my, uh, through my career. So George Hahn, um, the gentleman on your left there, um, was a, is really the uh, grandfather of hyperthermia biology. And so he was down in Stanford. And uh, when I was down there in 1987, I went up to George and I said, you know, I really like to do some experiments in the lab. Is that, is that OK? And I had never actually been in a lab before. Um, and so I was a huge risk, right? I could have spent a lot of money and, and wasted a lot of reagents, which I did. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, but he said, absolutely, you know, well, welcome. You know, come into the lab. And then he had asked one of his uh, scientific associates, Ina Van Kersen, uh, uh, to supervise me, to mentor me. And she taught me everything between pipetting to animal experiments. And we'd become you know, uh, fast friends uh, since then. And so he was really uh, very generous. And then when I came back to Toronto, uh, the the other three gentlemen, Dick Hill, Ian Tannock, and Vic Ling, who were at the at that time was called the Ontario Cancer Institute, now the Princess Margaret Cancer Research Institute, they took me also under my wings. Um, and uh, Dick Hill actually gave me a little corner uh, a, of space in his lab where I had my own incubator, my own hood, uh, and and he you know went through all the experiments with me, helped me to analyze the data because remember I actually never had any science uh, training before. Um, and Ian Tannock and Vic. Similarly, they would review my grants and my papers, taught me how to present uh, scientific seminars. And so these, uh, these gentlemen were absolutely fantastic. But notice that they're all men, <laughs> uh, because that was the way things were. And, but I've also had really fantastic role models. And so role models are different in that there are people that also advise you about your personal life. And so Brenda Galley, you know, is, is she was a ophthalmology uh, surgeon scientist at Sick Kids, and then came to the Princess Margaret uh, a few a few years, several years later, and she uh, had produced a lot of seminal work on defining the role of the retinoblastoma protein in retinoblastoma, which is a pediatric malignancy. Um, and I have always had a huge um, amount of admiration uh, for her personal and professional integrity. Uh, and so she, I've been a huge admirer of hers uh, forever. And Mary Gospodarowicz in the middle, she was my predecessor as uh, the chief and the chair of the programs. Um, and uh, one of her pieces of advice to me when I was very young, uh, after starting my staff job, um, was that, Fifi, do not expect to be a perfectionist. You've got to be the best physician you can be. You've got to be the best scientist you can be. But do not expect to be a perfect mother or a perfect wife. And you know, and that type of advice was really, it was kind of self-relieving, really, right? Because it allowed me not to have to perfect everything that I do, because it's absolutely impossible to do that. Um, and so therefore, you know, my husband and I, we have very low expectations as parents. So we've always said to ourselves that as long as neither of our kids were ax murderers, that could be considered to be success. And of course, neither of them in jail, so we're very successful parents. <laughs> Um, and then the woman, uh, Ann Phillips, Dr. Phillips, is, uh, is actually my best friend. Uh, she and I, we graduated from medical school together, and she had um, you know, worked successfully here in Toronto and in the academic world, and then transitioned incredibly successfully into private industry in the pharma uh, uh, sector, and is now the executive VP of North America in Novo Nordisk, uh, which is a Scandinavian-based uh, company. Um, and she, um, not only is she, of course, beautiful, but she she also has one of the highest uh, well-developed social intelligence I've ever seen. So she's been able to navigate incredibly successfully between the academic world and also the corporate world um, and the ability to read people, to know how to say the right things at the right time, but still maintaining that personal and professional integrity. And so we, um, you know, we don't get to see each other much all, uh, more anymore because she's moved down to Philadelphia. But you know, we get together a few times a year, and it's like one of these best friends relationships. You just pick up from where you left off, and it's as if you've never uh, been away from each other. 
Now, along the way, we've had, you know, the, the two boys, as I talked about. This is uh, Derek and, uh, and Trevor. And we've done a lot of family vacations together, which I think are really important. We've been really fortunate to be able to traverse to all corners of the, of the world. And, you know, here we have, you know, our, our trips in uh, Africa and South America and, uh, you know, Southeast Asia and also uh, in Alaska. And, and in fact, you know, the boys who are now 27 and 30 do recall that one of their fondest memories is actually all these uh, family vacations that we've uh, done together. Now, as I said, um, the titles of my slides have disappeared, but anyway, as I said, curiosity has been something that's always been a major motivation be behind everything that I do. And so now in my role as a chief of the radiation program, um, where, uh, and, and also as a chair of the university department, I have to think about what the future of healthcare delivery looks like. And so in our world of radiation oncology, we're very rule-based, and so therefore we're very um, amenable to having algorithms being written. And so one of the things that we do when we see each individual patient is design their treatment plan. And so the plan is, is targeted according to each individual patient, according to their anatomy, their contour, the stage of their disease, etc. And so Tom Purdy and Chris McIntosh, two very talented people in our program, have developed automated planning. And so that instead of a plan that normally would take six hours to generate, this can now be done within six minutes. So you can imagine the efficiency that can be uh, obtained as a result of these types of automation. And another thing is um, about automation is about workflow. And so the Princess Margaret Radiation Medicine Program is the world's largest single site facility. We have 16 linear accelerators. These are expensive machines that deliver the treatment. We have four CT simulations, two MR guided facilities, and we delivered more than 11,000 courses of radiation therapy last year. And every year it goes up because the incidence of cancer is increasing at two to 3% every single year. And so the question that Srini Raman, who is a new uh, faculty who joins us in, in September, he had a master's of engineering before he went to medical school at UBC. And so what he wanted to do was to collect the decade of data that we have in our program and ask ourselves, can we develop workflows that will be more efficient in terms of patient scheduling? So currently, the patient scheduling is conducted by four individuals trying to follow 250 protocols. And that can you imagine that's very time consuming and maybe it might not be the most efficient way of doing things. And so he's working in collaboration with Dr. Michael Carter, faculty in engineering and in mechanical industrial engineering, and to really try to determine whether or not we can use the big data that we've accumulated in our program to improve the efficiency and workflow within our program. And I think that's a huge value in terms of how we can capitalize on the technologies that are currently available with big data and AI. And here also is the concept of virtual clinics. So the Princess Margaret has 200, a quarter of a million outpatient visits every single year. And we're landlocked so that our geography and our space is not gonna get, in, get any bigger. We're, uh, in case people haven't noticed, we are a publicly funded system that is shrinking um, and we don't have any more resources in terms of funding or people. And so the question then is what percentage of our 250,000 visits every year can be converted into a Skype clinic or a virtual clinic. And so we're fortunate that in, within the province of Ontario, there already is a secure network called the Ontario Telemedicine Network so that patients can log on on their app at home, and we can also be in the hospital, or we could be at home, theoretically, and then be able to then have those types of interactions with our patients in, a, in the comfort of their home. And so whatever workflow and whatever uh, populations that we decide to pursue this with, we need to be able to evaluate it from the patient's perspective, from the provider's perspective, and also from the system perspective. So this is, I think, another really important activity we've got to get into uh, very quickly. And then the other thing, of course, is the wearable technologies, right? So how many people are wearing a Fitbit, right, right? And how many people have Apple Watches? I feel like I'm only one person? Okay, you must be the rich guy here. So, you know, so these wearable technologies are fantastic, right, because you can monitor, you have the ability to monitor your pulse, your respiratory rate, your blood pressure. You can do your EKG on the Apple Watch. I'm not sure why, but you can. You can monitor the number of steps you take. You can monitor your intravascular volume depletion. I mean, the whole 
ability to be able to do remote monitoring is how we have to exercise and execute and deliver clinical care in all of medicine in the future. And we need to figure out what we can do in the cancer space. So for example, for our patients receiving chemotherapy, Many of them will develop an entity called febrile neutropenia because your white cell count goes down to the bottom. And if you have any kind of bacteria that's circulating in their bloodstream, you're going to develop febrile neutropenia. And if you don't treat it urgently, patients are going to die. So imagine if we could actually develop predictive algorithms that can predict when a patient is going to develop febrile neutropenia. And then there's an alert that, call, that, that goes off. And then the nurse then can call the patient, call the pharmacy and say, Mr. Smith, go and fill out your antibiotic prescription right now, start taking it, and then that way you can prevent the complication, you can prevent an ER visit, and you can prevent an admission to the hospital. And I think that's the world that we need to really move into again very rapidly in order to be able to deliver the excellent care that we want to for our increasing number of patients uh, within a very limited uh, resource environment. Uh, okay, so. And uh, so that's the whole world about curiosity motivating in terms of how we have to do things better for our patients. The second theme I want to talk about is compassion. Compassion is obviously how we deliver our care. And here's a story that I want to tell about the gentleman uh, in the picture there, uh, Mr. Joe Finley. So Joe Finley unfortunately developed a very aggressive head neck cancer probably about 12 years ago, um, and his treatments were fairly uh, demanding with combination of chemotherapy and radiation therapy. But after he recovered from his treatment, um, he didn't have any disease at the time, and then he participated in his first sprint triathlon, which is a kilometer swim, 5K run, and 20 kilometer bike ride. And when he crossed that finish line, he had such a sense of achievement that he really wanted to share that with other people. And so after he finished his treatment, he approached myself and Dr. Brian O'Sullivan, who was his uh, personal physician, and said, I really want to give back to the Princess Margaret, and I would like to raise money. And what would the cause you think to be considered to be important? And so we said, well, if you could raise money for a translational research program in head and neck cancer, that would be really helpful for us and also for the future patients with head and neck cancer. And he said, great, I'll do it. So he f ran his, he hosted his first year of the Joe's Team Sprint Triathlon event for head and neck cancer research in Gravenhurst. And I have to confess, I didn't really pay too much attention to it. But in that first event, he raised $360,000. And I thought, oh my goodness, I better pay attention to this. And so we had participated. And so this event ran for about 10 years uh, and raised a total of $12 million uh, for the head neck cancer program. And we and my family and our team had participated in about almost all of them, except for the first one. And here's a picture of the team of uh, people who had participated and it's really important for the 500 participants to see the folks at the hospital and the research institute side so that they could really understand the people who are doing the work and who are also benefiting uh, from the funds that they have raised. And another thing that's really important, so here's a, a picture of the team of our radiation therapists within our radiation medicine program. So this was just from a month ago where they had a kind of a, a food raiser, a competitive team challenge, and, um, and we raised 800 pounds of food that was donated to the Daily Bread Food Bank. And this is really important in terms of compassion for our fellow citizens because the city of Toronto is unfortunately the poverty capital of Canada. And it's really important to, for us also in the healthcare to understand that and to help because one of the most important determinants of outcome for health is actually your socioeconomic class. And so we all have an obligation and want to be able to be compassionate to our fellow citizens to help them to get through the, the daily rigors of their lives and to be able to help to um, improve their socioeconomic class. And then the last theme I want to talk about is uh, clarity. So it is really important, now the, the title here was Clarity and Focus and Purpose. And so it's really important to be very clear about what it is that you do and, and why you're doing it and to be, be very perseverant and be passionate about the work that you pursue. 
And so the title of this one was The Seven Seas of Communication. So the first clarity is clarity of communication. So for example, I'm communicating with you and I have to be clear about the message that I'm trying to convey. I have to be concise. So don't spend 30 minutes in speaking about something that you could actually convey in five minutes. Don't waste people's time. Be concrete in terms of providing examples of the message that you're trying to convey. And this applies to everything. To, it applies to today's uh, communication. It applies when you're writing a research proposal, when you're writing a paper, uh, when you're trying to inspire your team to execute a project, uh, providing clear examples of things that you're going to be proposing or that you have done. You have to be factually accurate, of course, to be correct. It has to be coherent. It has to have a logical flow. It has to have a beginning, it has to have a middle, and obviously it has to have a final conclusion of the story of or, or your narrative. And you have to be complete in your story. You can't just tell part of your story, and then people are trying to figure out, well, where exactly are you going with this? And you have to be courteous. You have to be considerate, obviously, respectful of people's time, for example. And so those are the seven C's of communication. So it's clarity in communication. Communication is really important in all walks of life. It doesn't matter what kind of profession you're going to be pursuing. And if you don't, bad things can happen. This is a joke cartoon. Okay, there's a patient, right? So if you don't get your communication clear, uh, bad things can happen. And in fact, communication is one of the most important aspects of uh, quality and safety in the healthcare world. And also the clarity of purpose. So here is the statement is the best way to succeed is to have a specific intent, a clear vision, an action plan, and the ability to maintain that clarity. So the, the perseverance and the consistency is really important and also remembering why you want to do what it is that you want to do. And so here in the radiation medicine program, um, uh, we have developed a vision. So our vision is very simple. It's three short phrases. Precision radiation medicine, because our radiation is targeted. Personalized care, so it is customized according to every single individual's need. And global impact, because we're an ambitious program. We want to benefit the patients within Toronto, but also regionally, nationally, and also internationally. We have a mission statement, and that is that we want to advance exemplary radiation medicine through patient care, research, and education in partnership, in partnership with our patients and in partnership with our communities, whether there be governmental communities, whether it be faculty of engineering across our university campuses, across many of the other research institutes, again, locally, regionally, and nationally, internationally. And we're also anchored on our core values of innovation, excellence, collaboration, accountability because we're spending taxpayers' money, and also integrity in everything that we pursue, personal and professional integrity. So in quick conclusion then, um, the path to human life is not linear. If someone told me when I was in medical school that one day I would be a, a chair of chief of a program, I would say, what are you, smoking? Um, and you know, most of you are here in that little higher education pond right now, and you can see that your career path is never going to be linear. And it shouldn't be linear. You have to be able to take opportunities, and opportunities come to those who are most ready to capture those opportunities. Always be excellent in what you pursue, and be passionate, and be convincing, and be convinced yourself that this is the right path to pursue. And you will be able to, you know, as I just described to you, I was going to do medical oncology, I ended up in radiation oncology. I was just going to be a regular, you know, regular physician, and I ended up in the, in the lab. And you can see from my research interests that they've actually been very, very kind of all over the place in one way, but really being a successful laboratory scientist is really being an entrepreneur because you have to be able to write grant applications to capture those grants, to be able to support your business of your lab. You have to be able to um, organize your team of people, of graduate students, technicians, postdocs, managers, to be able to run that shop efficiently uh, effectively, but also you've got to be competitive because science is competitive. And then you've got to be able to then capture your opportunities. I never had any ambition to be a chair or a chief um, in, in, until Mary Gospodarowicz has said to me, okay, Fifi, you're doing great in your current job. You're impacting on your lab. You're impacting on your patients. But what about 
actually expanding and amplifying that impact to an entire program and faculty. And I never thought about that, but then once I listened to her, I thought this is a really good advice. Now let me figure out how to do that. And then of course it was a, a competitive search process, et cetera. And now I'm trying to figure out what my next path is going to be before I retire. And so the other thing is always enjoy life. Um, you know, as I've mentioned, we've been really fortunate to have been able to uh, travel all sorts of, uh, all, all the all corners of the world. And we did a lot of fun things, you know, donkey ride, I think that was in Northern Africa. Um, and also always be a team player because you can never be successful as any single individual. You're always a member of a community and you've got to be able to work as a team uh, and be very collaborative and in fact, the, the key to networking is generosity. Be generous with your ideas, and therefore, people will want to come to you and to seek your advice and seek your guidance and to seek your ideas. And so that collaboration spirit is really important. And build the teams and develop your network that's going to be really helpful for yourself but everybody else on the team. It's never just about you. It's about you and your team. And think about it in that way. Um, and we'd always, we participated. Uh, so our Princess Margaret Cancer Center has run a ride uh, to conquer cancer which is a 200 kilometer bike ride from Toronto to Niagara Falls. And we had participated in the first uh, six years and it was really a lot of fun. And that picture on your right here is my participating in the first year where I was wearing a cast because during my training ride, I'm not naturally athletic, uh, just in case you wonder, uh, and I broke my elbow. Um, but you know, I trained so hard that I wasn't gonna like not ride. And so I participated in the first year. Riding with a cast was a bit of a drag, but it was, you know, the, the same sense of exhilaration in crossing that finish line is just absolutely uh, amazing. Um, and uh, always have your anchors, right? So I've been really fortunate. Uh, there's my, uh, my, my brother and my mother. I think this was her 90th birthday. She's 96 years old now. Um, and, uh, and that's uh, my husband of 33 years, Richard, who is my uh, best friend and uh, has provided me with a lot of support over the years so that every time I'm you know, writing my grants you know, on the weekends, in the evenings, he's there looking after our uh, two uh, kids who are not ax murderers. Um, and uh, take risks. The, the here, here was be fearless, right? So take risks. Because I always say, you know, the definition of a successful entrepreneur is somebody who's failed at least once or twice, right? So you got to take calculated risks. Uh, don't be stupid about it. Now here, for example, I'm swimming with sharks, but it ain't the big white, is it? They're nurse sharks. They're incredibly docile. They're not going to do anything. But, you know, I'm swimming with sharks. And the other is, a, is an iguana on the Galapagos Islands. Uh, and also, this part is about socializing. Now, the picture with that uh, fellow on the left, that's uh, Woody Well. So he uh, was, you know, was my best friend that we spent a year together down in Stanford. You know, and he's uh, back in Toronto now, and we you know, continue to be uh, best friends and be supports for each other. Um, you know, we have uh, host a Christmas party every year. Everybody you know, sings uh, Christmas carols like... Uh, Hallelujah by, uh, <laughs> so it's not classical, but you know, it's, it's good. Um, and um, oh, and the picture on the, the right lower hand side, that's, uh, that's Coachella. <laughs> How many people have, obviously everybody's heard of Coachella. How many people have been to Coachella? What, nobody's been to Coachella? Oh, that's interesting. Okay, well, <laughs> obviously people have heard of Coachella. So every time Richard and I showed up. I'm sure we doubled the median age of all the people there. And you know, this was our kids. I said, oh, you know, mom and dad, you'd be really cool if you went to Coachella. And he said, okay, what's that? Uh, anyways, it was a really interesting experience. I've uh, been there, done that. Um, and, and the title of this slide is Our Purpose. So the reason that we get up every single morning to come to work is to look after our patients and deliver the best compassionate and exemplary care for our patients. So always know what the purpose of your actions are. So uh, thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions.